<clears throat> Good morning, everyone. Let's all stand, if you're able, and sing number 66 to the hymnal. To God be the glory. Great things he hath done. standing and let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we're so thankful for the opportunity to be here to worship you. We're thankful for the great things that you have done in our lives. We're thankful for Jesus. We're thankful for the cross. We're thankful for the redemption that we have in Christ and how you came to earth and you lived and you shed your blood and you gave up your life for us. We give you praise and thanksgiving because you are the great Savior. And today we remember that gospel message. I pray it would go forth, make a difference in all of our lives. And those who have never heard of this wonderful message, help us, Lord, to listen to your word and follow your way. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, and you may be seated. I'm going to get the computer to work again for a second. All right, our next song, though, is number 77. This is one that um, we haven't done in a long time, but it's very short, so. Okay, join, on, join in with it. It's really short and easy. <laughs> Young kings and lord of lords, glory, hallelujah. sing it as a round next, okay? So this is one of those uh, songs that comes from comes from the Hebrew tradition of praise 
And uh, so we're gonna we're gonna sing it in a round. And if you we don't really have enough people like it. Okay, like you know this side of the church, you sing with me, and the rest of you sing with Connie. You can join in however you want to. But we're gonna be singing opposite lines once we get going here. So you can join in whenever you want. everybody here this morning. Um, had technical difficulties. I had no clue how this somehow this happened, but I lost my screen and I'm waiting for it to load up. So give us a couple of minutes before we do that. Just to go over the announcements this morning. Uh, Wednesday, uh, we have our Wednesday meeting on the 2nd of, of February. If you would like to be a part of that, we have a good time of prayer and um, we look at the word of God as well. We're following along in the book of Galatians, I think we finished Galatians this week, so I think we'll just go right on to Ephesians. We're in Galatians, and now we'll be reading in Ephesians. I take small passages, 10 to 20 verses at the max, 20 is the max, and each day, and I share in Facebook. You guys are all welcome to be a part of that, and then meet on Wednesdays when we have a discussion about the most relevant, I think, passage that we can think of, and so I hope you can be there for that. Uh, our Sunday night youth meeting at 5 o'clock. I don't think we're going to be able to do that this week, but hopefully next week we'll get started with that once everyone's here, and uh, we'll plan for that. So let's see if I can bring up the rest of the songs for today. And just give me a couple seconds here. So I'll tell you what I'll do. Had a windy week, right? Pretty windy. <laughs> I mean, we're all walking outside. Hopefully the wind doesn't blow us quite right over. So anyway, so I thought, if I'm gonna, if I'm gonna bring some humor in, I thought it should be theme related. So that's what's going around here. So what is a gust of wind's favorite color? Anyone? Not red, but blue. Yeah, okay, that's a good one. Some people are just looking at me like, where'd you get that? It's blue. Where does a gust of wind go on vacation? This is easy. Bullhead City. <laughs> um, uh, do you like renewable energy? Well, actually, I'm a big fan of renewable energy. So that's another wind joke, yeah, okay. Um, uh, how do you stop your newspaper from flying away in the wind? Use a news anchor. We, I'm still not, okay, one more and I'll be done. What do you call iron blowing in the wind? What's the, what's the uh, chemical symbol for iron? F-E, right? So it's Febreze. Fabrice. Okay, one more. I'm sorry. What day of the week has, oh, this is easy. What day of the week has to be most powerful gusts of wind? We all know that's what? Which day of the week? Wednesday, right? Yeah, Wednesday. All right, so anyway, those are my jokes for the week. Okay, so let me bring up the songs. Um, might have to bring in a new computer for this because 
this is the second time in three weeks I've had technical things with the computer. But um, anyway, I hope you all had a great week. And uh, uh, with all um, with all the COVID going on, it's been interesting. We've been trying to wade through all of that. So I guess we'll honor uh, by faith that we're gonna get. We're not gonna be able to do it. We'll just see how how deep the waters go. Okay, sorry about those things. We're um, trying to work on this. I'm trying to make it move a little bit smoothly, so I'm working on transitioning some of these things to some of my helpers, uh, so I'm not having to juggle everything, but still working on that. Still not quite there with that, so I will hopefully in the next couple of weeks we'll have less of these technical distractions um, when they become more distracting than their help, probably should get rid of them, right? So anyway, maybe we need to do that. We'll see. Anyway, so today we're continuing our study of the book of Acts. And uh, let me turn this mic on. We're in the book of Acts. Last week, we finished up chapter 18. We learned about a guy named Apollos and his power and, and his willing to be taught, willing to be a person who had a lot of like spiritual power. He was a preacher and we heard about him and how he had to take a step back and be instructed by people that weren't really preachers necessarily, Aquila and Priscilla. We read about them being used of the Lord to instruct someone in the right way of the truth. Uh, I was, I've, I've been really concerned about truth and you know I've been talking about apologetics. Which that's what apologetics is all about answering and answering the questions that people have from the Bible. And I believe there's truth in the Word of God. I think it's, it can stand on its own. It can, it can stand on its own and it can make a difference for truth. Every question about right and wrong, is, it emanates from God's Word. Uh, and I don't think people really understand that enough, especially in today's society. 
where people will say, you know, it doesn't really matter. Truth is just relative. That concept of relativism is a real problem for me. It continues to haunt me as I see people calling themselves believers and they believe the Bible and they believe the truth of the Bible. But when they make decisions about morality, it's based on relativism. It's just how I feel. They look around society and society says we should do it this way. And they have never even looked at what God says. So truth is such a huge thing. I think we really need to get a hold of it. And so uh, today uh, we're going to look at the gospel. The gospel is the truth of God. It is the truth of salvation. It's the truth of eternal life. That's why it's so important. You hear me talk about the gospel a lot. We're going through the Acts. A lot of my messages, gospel is in the, in the title. The gospel threat, threatens and transforms is what we see here in this chapter. It's going to threaten people's very economic stability. It's going to affect the way they get their money. It's going to have a negative effect in this particular situation. Uh, and I wanted to show you this before we move on in Acts. Okay. We are in the book of Acts. And the chapters that we're looking at is known as Paul's third missionary journey. Probably should go back and show you the first and second. I'll, maybe I'll do that next week. But Paul's missionary journey, if I, if I walk over here and I follow the map, uh, started in Antioch, and it goes this way. We have seen uh, Paul in uh, Antioch, the city. We saw him in the city of Pisidia earlier. We saw him in Miletus. And now we're in Ephesus, the city of Ephesus. And Ephesus is right on the... Uh, coast of what is modern-day Turkey, uh, and it's, it's right here. Asia Minor, they call it in the New Testament. It's right here on the coast. It is an amazing city. It's a glorious city. It's a city where there's much trade going on. Really rich people live there. There's, much, much, there's lots of merchants. There's this, uh, it's, a, it's one of the great cities of the Roman Empire, Ephesus is. Um, but Paul was able to establish church in Ephesus. The city had almost 200,000 people. It's one of the largest cities in the Roman Empire. It's noted for magic arts, especially for the Temple of Artemis. And you might know it from the King James Bible as the Temple of Diana. And if you look at the front of your bulletins, those are the ruins of the Temple of Diana. It was the greatest. In fact, it's one of the seven man-made wonders of the world, the Temple of Diana in the book of Ephesus. Uh, and uh, Artemis is an interesting god. I'm not going to give you all the details. You want to look it up, you can. Uh, it's one of the seven one of the, It was four times the size of the Parthenon in Athens. God opened the door for Paul into the stronghold of Satan, so the church was established, and the word of the Lord was growing mightily and prevailing, it says in chapter 19. In fact, all who lived in Asia heard the word of the Lord, both Jews and Greeks, it says here. So this was a huge, important part of the, of the spread of the gospel because so many people knew about Ephesus. They stopped there if they were traveling in the Roman Empire. They knew about it. It was a great city. But they also heard about Paul and the gospel here because of what happens in this next passage. So we're going to cover a lot of verses, but I'm not going to spend too much time on each part of the section of the verses. So let's start in chapter 19. Uh, we are looking again at the gospel thriving and transforming and threatening. I, I say thriving, transforming, and, and threatening. Let's look at the first couple verses and happen. While Paulus was at Corinth, Paul, remember, Paulus, we already heard about him at Corinth, passed through the country and came to Ephesus. There he found some disciples and he said to them, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? And they said, no, we have not even heard that there is a Holy Spirit. And he said, into what then were you baptized? They said, into John's baptism. And Paul said, John baptized with the baptism of repentance, telling the people to believe in the one who was to come after him, that is Jesus. On hearing this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. When Paul had laid hands on them, the Holy Spirit came on them and they began speaking in tongues and prophesying. There are about 12 men in all. The gospel thrives when God's working, God is doing a great work amongst these people. And when Paul shows up to the church of Ephesus, he hears about them that they had been preaching the, the baptism of John. And we talked about this last week. That's where Apollos was as well. It's not, it's not a mistake that Apollos is mentioned here. 
while Paul's with Paul passed through the inland. So it mentions Apollos, and that's that connection. I would imagine that uh, Paul, Apollos might even had an impact on the gospel that was in, um, in Ephesus. I think he might have even had an impact, maybe sending people from his own church to preach there. But uh, here it says they were into this John's baptism. And, and we all know that John is the forerunner of Jesus Christ. We hear about him in the New Testament. We hear John the Baptist in all four Gospels. At the very beginning of the Gospel, John the Baptist is always mentioned. In all four of the Gospels, he's mentioned before Jesus comes around. Uh, we read about uh, John the Baptist actually before he was born. We, we read about him in the womb, right? Because we know about Elizabeth uh, Elizabeth and, and uh, the, the priest Levi in the church and uh, we hear about them as well in the beginning of the gospel. So he is the forerunner. He, he proclaims, there's going to be somebody coming after me. And he's going to be greater. And you need to follow him. His name is going to be Jesus. And you need to listen. And so he would preach this repentance. And, and the emphasis on repentance. I think that's the two words I always talk about the gospel. You need to repent and believe. Well, the people of John the Baptist, they preach the gospel of repentance and repent of your sins because what the Messiah is coming. So the second part of the, the gospel formula in a sense, repent and believe that's Jesus. So John the Baptist, he still maybe had not heard for certain that Jesus was the Messiah yet. And these people hadn't heard the whole story about Jesus. And then Paul comes and gives them that complete story. But when God is working, even though these people hadn't heard the name of Jesus yet, when God is working, when they hear that Jesus is the Messiah, there's a complete acceptance to that. I think this is true. If someone's a true believer in Jesus, they're they're trusting Christ in this world. When there are other issues, doctrinal issues, about a lot of different things that come around, basic morality, believers are going to find the truth. They are going to find the truth. If, if they seek it and they find it from God's word, they're going to read about truth. They're going to read, they're going to hear about the Trinity and they're going to accept the Trinity. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit as one. If they're a true believer in Jesus of the gospel. I think similarly, that's what happens with these people. They had heard about repentance. They'd heard Jesus is coming. And then when they're told that Jesus came, he is the Messiah, they accepted it because they were seeking the truth and the truth was in their hearts. God is doing something great. The gospel is thriving. And when Paul comes around, some amazing things are about to happen. Now, uh, the rest of the past, he entered the synagogue and for three months spoke boldly, reasoning and persuading them about the kingdom of God. But when some became stubborn and continued in unbelief, speaking of the evil way before the congregation, he withdrew from them and took the disciples with him, reasoning daily in the hall of Tyrannus. This continued for two years that all of the residents of Asia heard the word of the Lord, both Jews and Greeks. Did you hear what it says there? Paul Paul spread the gospel for two years, and it said all heard the gospel. Now, in that previous passage, we read of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit leads them to the truth. And it also says what? Earlier, in fact, I'm going to go back and take a look at those verses. Um, It also says on... On hearing this, as they were baptized, it says, the Holy Spirit came on them and they began speaking in tongues and prophesying. God was doing a great work. The Holy Spirit was working in people's lives and great things were happening. Uh, They were speaking in tongues. Why were they speaking in tongues? Because there were people from a lot of different languages there. And they were able to speak in a different language the gospel message. It's not this gibberish. It's not uh, some of the modern day... Uh, charismatic churches sometimes, I question some of those kinds of things. Uh, Are they speaking in tongues to help someone understand the word of God? And that's what the tongues in the New Testament is all about. They were speaking in tongues, telling the gospel in a different language. Prophecy, what does that mean? Foretelling. It's being able to look at the scripture and be able to apply it to a person's life. That's what was happening with these people. And they were doing it amongst each other. Like they were with friends and they might get together and they're talking about the word of God. How should we live? Uh, they, they hear about other doctrines. They hear, you know, it's like someone might be in a place and they, 
in a group of people and you're having a discussion and start, hey, what about this group and this group and this group? What do they teach? Well, here it says these people, God was giving them the understanding so that as they're talking with each other, they're able to speak the truth as the truth of the Bible. And God's giving them that illumination. The Holy Spirit will give you the illumination and understanding of the scripture if you go at it with the right heart. That's what's happening here. It's an amazing thing. And then, uh, and then Paul is speaking for two years, it says, every single person heard. There was no one that was not accountable to having been exposed to Jesus Christ. No one. It was heard by everyone because it was, it was controversial. People were listening. They were telling the believers were on fire. They were telling people about it. It was fantastic. Man, we can totally be uplifted and we can be encouraged by these believers. They were, they were on fire for Jesus, telling the gospel. It was fantastic. God was doing a great work. The gospel, the gospel is there. God is working and it's an amazing thing. One more thing I want to point out in these passages. Uh, and God was doing extraordinary miracles by the hands of Paul so that even handkerchiefs or aprons that had touched his skin were carried away to the sick and diseases left them and the evil spirit came out of them. Now, in today's world, we have, we have evangelists saying, look, I've got it. I, I haven't seen this, but it used to be a big thing. You watch te- televangelists and they would have a, you know, send me $500, I'll send you a, a handkerchief that I just touched that's going to heal you. No. That's not how God works. God was doing such a great work here. That was happening though, here. It was fantastic. I can't imagine, I don't understand it. I can't imagine this. This is apostolic work. It was for the church that time. Our doctrine of our Baptist church and most Baptist churches says that was for the apostolic time. It wasn't for today. And we don't see that kind of healing today. We can, not that we can't, but we don't see that healing for today. I think that's the biblical view. But God is doing a great work here. He can do a great work in our lives. It may not be exactly in the same way that we see here. But God was doing a great work in an amazing way. It was unique to that apostolic age uh, in verses 11 and 12. The gospel threatens satanic forces when it is proclaimed. So when God's word is making a difference, Satan is not happy. And he's going to do everything he can to upset and make it difficult. Look at what happens in verses 13 through 17. Then some of the itinerant Jewish exorcists undertook to invoke the name of the Lord Jesus over those who had evil spirits, saying, I adjure you by the Jesus whom Paul proclaims. Seven sons of a Jewish high priest named Sceva were doing this. But the evil spirit answered them and said, Jesus I know and Paul I recognize, but who are you? And the man in whom was the evil spirit leaped on them, mastered all of them and overpowered them. So they fled out of that house naked and wounded. And this became known to all the residents of Ephesus, Both Jews and Greeks and fear fell upon them and the name of the Lord Jesus was extolled. There were people that are watching what Paul was doing and all they want to do is be on the bandwagon with it. They were wanting to do this magic and they thought, if Paul can do this, so can I do this. They weren't looking at it like, wow, that's God working. Man, maybe I should get right with God. Maybe I should study the scripture. Maybe I should get to know Jesus so I can be one of his disciples. That's not how they looked at it. They were like, well, that's magic. I want magic. They had the wrong attitude. They were not men of God. And they wanted this thing. And what happens? That evil spirit just destroys, goes after them, doesn't he? The evil spirit leaped, mastered all of them and overpowered. They fled out of the house naked and wounded. They were messing with the evil spirit. They were trying, trying to get what Paul was doing, but instead of going about it the right way and studying the scripture and getting to know God better. Like this is, this is wild what's happening. So much stuff is going on. Everybody's seeing Jesus work here, by the way. Everybody's seeing the Holy Spirit make some amazing, amazing things happen. Uh, (coughs) That's what we see here. And the gospels threaten satanic forces and he threatens the satanic forces of today. And, and I think we need to take stock in that and like feel like, you know, Satan is real. He, he's out there. He's alive and well in this world. I, I don't know that, I don't think we see, 
as you know, we don't see the demonic acts of evil demons. I think they're working. It's an interesting book that was written back in the what late 70s. It's called This Present Darkness. It's a really interesting book, and I, I wish someone would update it and redo it because it's so interesting. I think it could be updated and made more relevant for today. But anybody read the book This Present Darkness back in the 80s? 70s and 80s is when they were big. Then there was another one called Piercing the Darkness. So what it does, it tells, it tells the story of this, this town where there's this church and there's a lot of evil forces. You know, there's, there's evil people that are doing things. You know, like, like in all of our towns, they're doing things that are against godly principles. And, you know, there's different forces going on. And in this present darkness, the way the guy writes it, he, he pictures this battle of the demons and the angels like in a second dimension and they're fighting each other and like there's this woman who's who's being abused and the person that's abusing her her husband or her boyfriend is abusing her that person is being controlled by this demon and she's being brought in and drawn in because she's so sad and she's despairing and she's being brought in by this demon but then an angel comes in and there's an old lady that lives down the street that's praying for this woman and she's praying for her and you see the angel like this praying for her to trust the lord and to be in the church and to be around believers and and so she's she is uh she's changed by that because of the the power of prayer now there are some questions about God's sovereignty with that, but that's an interesting way to think of it. And we know, we know the spiritual battle is going on. I, I think that was an interesting way to present it. Uh, the spiritual battle between Satan and the forces of God, and that's what we saw here. We saw these people that, that uh, want to be involved in this spiritual work, and Satan knows who they are and just scares them off, become, goes after them. Uh, so that, Satan is real. He's out there, he's working, but God will win if we trust him, if we put our faith and trust in him as these people did. The gospel threatens satanic forces. Let's look at the next couple of verses. The gospel transforms lives. Look at verses 18 through 20. Also, many of those who are now believers come, confessing and divulging their practices, and a number of those who had practiced magic arts brought their books together and burned them in the sight of all. And they counted the value of them and found it came to 50,000 pieces of silver. So the word of the Lord continued to increase and prevail mightily. So what are the magic arts? It's not like, it's not like the sleight of hand. You know, it's not like David Copperfield you know, show in Vegas. Who's the, guy, who's the most popular like, magician out there? That guy's just, he is just... He is just fooling your brains. There is no supernatural. It's like Scooby-Doo, you know, the original Scooby-Doo, you know, the original Scooby-Doo, the go, you know, the original Ghostbusters, right? But if you watch the old ones, now the new ones have changed. I remember watching the movie and I'm going, wait a minute, this isn't right. There's, there's something weird going on because with Scooby-Doo, it was all fake, wasn't it? You watch the old cartoons, you know, Scooby-Dooby-Doo, where are you? <laughs> Everything in, the, in that show was fake. There was a guy with a projector casting a picture of a ghost on the wall, and everybody thought there was a real ghost. Scooby-Doo and his group, they figure it out, and they find out. There is, no mad, there is no supernatural stuff going on in those cartoons. Watch every single one of the old ones, and there is no supernatural. And my mom and dad let me watch it. You know, what? Why would they let you watch a show about the evil of ghosts, right? Now, in today's world... There's all sorts of supernatural stuff on TV and there's supernatural stuff you hear about and that kind of thing. Now, I don't know about all those things because, again, there's a lot of different things out there, but I know there's two spirits in this world. There's the spirit of Christ and there's the spirit of Satan. And Satan's in charge of all of the evil spirits. When there's something supernatural that happens that's not of God, that is not in his will, then you better stay away from it. You know, and I know a lot of people, are, they talk a lot about, you know, people that tell you the future and, and you know, they can, they can read your mind or they can tell you what's going to happen in the future, all those kinds of things. It's either from the Lord or it's not. And if a person's doing that and they have no connection with Jesus at all, 
then you have no reason to believe it, and you probably should really be suspect anyway because that's the way God's working in today's world. But that's what's happening here. You've got all these people involved. They're wanting to do supernatural. They're wanting to. There's something else out there. There is another plane of existence. There is, if it's another plane of existence and it's supernatural, then you better be careful about it. I think that's what we're, what we're being taught here. So these, these believers uh, confessing and devoting. So these were believers, it says. Uh, they had been... They'd come to Jesus, and they'd been involved in some of these supernatural art-type things. And so what do they do? They bring them, and they, uh, and they counted the value of them and found it. So the word of the Lord continued to increase and prevail. And they burned them, it says. Burned them in the sight of all. 50,000 pieces of silver, the, those things that they used for that, you know, whatever it was that they were using to tell the future, to do whatever, they threw them into the fire. We don't need any of that. You know, we don't need a horoscope. We don't need any of those things. You have to be careful about some of those things. Some people are really into it, and I don't know exactly what their reasoning is about it. It's just for fun. Uh, you know, some people say, well, it's in the stars, you know, or, you know, the, the stars, and somehow there's some sort of spiritual connection. The scripture really doesn't teach that kind of thing, so we have to be very careful with that. So, the gospel transforms lives. It changes people's lives. They were in that kind of stuff and they threw their stuff in the fire. Uh, different ways that we can get rid of things that cause us to, to sin. I know back in the 80s when, you know, there was, there was a lot of satanic rock. I remember going to camp and uh, people would bring their records. they get right with Jesus and somehow they brought their records to camp. So we would take those records and we'd fling them in the air with our shotguns and we'd blow those things up. You know, like... I don't know what groups they were, but the ones, the satanic ones. You know, not the ones with trite lyrics about love or any. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about the ones they, they, they speak of Satan. You know, and we would, yeah, we'd throw those things up and boom, these, these kids would come with their, somehow they showed up at camp. They're not supposed to bring that stuff, but somehow it was in the back of their car. And so we would destroy those things and we'd take it out and shotgun and shoot them. So that's not something believers should be a part of. Number three, gospel transformed lives versus, well, we just studied that one. So let's move on to the next point, verses 18 through 20. And this next one is, is uh, a little bit longer. So let's take a look at it. Reaction of those who reject the gospel, verses 21 through 41. This is a longer passage. So I'm going to read through it and then I'll just make a few comments. Now, after these events, Paul resolved in the spirit to pass through Macedonia and Achaia to go to Jerusalem, saying, after I have been there, I must also see Rome. And having sent into Macedonia two of his helpers, Timothy the Rastus, he himself stayed in Asia for a while. <coughs> About that time there arose a little disturbance concerning the way. For a man named Demetrius, a silversmith who made silver shrines of Artemis, Artemis is also known as Diana, bought, brought no little business to the craftsmen. These he gathered together with the workmen in similar trades and said, Men, you know what from this business we have our wealth. And you see and hear that not only in Ephesus, but in almost all of Asia, this Paul is persuaded and termed away a great many people, saying that gods made with hands are not gods. What do you think about that statement? Gods made with hands are not gods? That's what Paul preached, right? There's only one God. It's Jesus. He's the only God. Everything else, and, and, and when I say God, it's God with a big G. It's the God of the universe. It's the creator. All these other gods are created by men. Or they are gods that come from Satan. They're controlled by Satan. And so he's saying, how could he say that our statues are not gods? That's what he's worried about. And you see and hear that not only enough, but not, um, and then verse 27, there's danger not only that this trait of ours may come to, into disrepute, but also the temple of the great goddess Artemis, or Diana, may be counted as nothing, and that she may be even deposed from her magnificence, she whom all Asia and the world worship. When they heard this, they were enraged and were crying out, Great is Artemis of the Ephesians. So the city was filled with confusion, and they rushed together into the theater, dragging with them Gaius and Aristarchus, Macedonians who were Paul's companions in travel. But when Paul wished to go in among the crowd, the disciples would not let him. And even some of the Asiarchs, who were friends of his, sent him and were urging him not to venture into the theater. 
Now some cried out one thing, some another, for the assembly was in confusion. <coughs> and most of them did not know what they, why they did come together. Some of the crowd prompted Alexander, whom the Jews had put forward. And Alexander, motioning with his hand, wanted to make a defense to the crowd. But when they recognized that he was a Jew for about two hours, they all cried out with one voice, Great is Artemis of the Ephesians. And when the town clerk had quieted the crowd, he said, Men of Ephesus. Well, I'll get to these last verses. Reaction of those who reject the gospel. This is opposition. Opposition by those that were against the gospel. Why were they against the gospel? Because it's going to hurt them economically. This is the silversmith. What did he make? He made statues of Artemis. I am embarrassed to tell you what that statue would look like. Does anybody know what I'm talking about? I'm not going to, I'm not going to tell you what it is. I'll let you look it up if you want. Artemis was kind of obscene. And that guy made, that's what he made. He made silver trof trophies, silver statues that people could put in their homes to worship this, this God. And it's interesting the way it's stated here because Demetrius really is saying, you know, we have these statues and the statues are our God and we want that to be true because we're making lots of money because of it. I really don't think Demetrius really believed that Artemis was really God. I really believe when you study the, the mythology of the Romans and the Greeks, it's really hard to believe that they actually believe those gods were real. It, it feels to me in so many ways that the mythology of the Greeks and the Romans was, is, is kind, was kind of like entertainment for them. It was like watching a soap opera for us. You know, they, they, they followed the stories of the Greeks they follow the stories of uh, all these people that are in those stories. Some people just love it. I know, I know believers who just love the stories. They're interesting stories. And, and uh, there's, there's, it's like fiction. Not necessarily horrible. You read the Greek mythology and you hear the stories and there's lessons to be learned. And I, when you read about some of these things, you're just amazed. And I really don't know if Demetrius is just a believer that... Artemis really is a God who's going to do something actual in their lives. Nothing, he will do nothing personal for them. But he is upset that the gospel of Jesus Christ is affecting him economically. And I was thinking, you know, that's something that we always have to kind of consider. And we make economic decisions, hopefully for the good, sometimes because we do things according to God's word. And we have, we're honest in our business uh, we care about employees. Uh, if we're an employer, uh, we work hard in our business. Uh, like I'm a teacher, you know, and, and, and the last couple of weeks there's been some, something that's really bothering me uh, with one of my colleagues that I really love. And I'm trying to figure out ways that I can be a better employee with this person so I can lift him up and build him up. Those are principles that I learned from God's word. How can I build up someone that I love? How do I build them up and work with that person? Uh, we, we're, we're affected by God's word. But sometimes when we, we have to take a stand and it's going to affect us economically. That's what Demetri is so upset about. He is going to lose money. Maybe he had a hankering or had a, a thought to believe. Everybody's seeing what God is doing. Demetri is not blind. He saw the miracles that was happening. But the money was more important to him. So many of us make decisions based on economics, and we forget about the Lord. We forget about, like, you know, we don't put him first sometimes. I think that's what we can learn from these passages here. Uh, so when the clerk, finally somebody got involved. By the way, this is a common theme throughout Acts. Paul is a Roman citizen, proclaiming the gospel to the Roman world. Perfect time to do it, because not only was he a Roman citizen, the Roman world had the Roman roads. You could travel all over. It was fantastic. But also, Paul was a Roman citizen. And he could go into cities and proclaim the gospel. And if they said, you can't do that, he'd go, yeah, I can. I'm a Roman citizen. I have the right to preach. They had freedom of religion. We've talked about this before. In fact, I have a message I pulled out as I was studying for this that I had preached on the 4th of July. And it was all the times that Paul invoked the Roman constitution preaching the gospel. 
he's like an American preacher who's making a difference, preaching the gospel, and people are upset with it, and they're trying to stop him from preaching. He's just like that, because he invokes the Constitution. He says, I'm a Roman citizen. I have the right to preach the gospel. Throw me in jail. Yeah, go ahead, but you're, you're breaking the law. And he always, he always gets out, because you've got people like this dude here, who is the town clerk. He quieted the crowd and said, Men of Ephesus, who is there who does not know that the city of Ephesians is a temple keeper of the great Artemis and of the sacred stone that fell from the sky? Seeing then that these things cannot be denied, you ought to be quiet and do nothing rash. For you have brought these men here who are neither sacrilegious nor blasphemers of our... It's interesting because there hadn't been any, like, any preaching against the goddess Diana. If therefore Demetrius and the craftsmen with him have a complaint against anyone, the courts are open and there are proconsuls. Let them bring charges against one another. But if you seek anything further, it shall be said in the regular assembly. For we really are in danger of being charged with rioting today, since there is no cause that we can give to justify this commotion. When he had said these things, he dismissed the assembly. So what's happening here is Paul is preaching Jesus. That's all he's doing. And from what's said by the town clerk, he's not preaching. Go throw your, your, your uh, idol of uh, Artemis in the fire. Did people throw the, their idols of Artemis in the fire? Probably. But you know why they did it? Because Jesus preached Jesus. And he said there's only one God. And he preached that God is the great God of the universe. And there is no other gods. And there's no reason to worship an idol. And so they said, I am going to throw my, temp, my statue of Artemis. But the clerk is saying that's not what he's hearing. All he needs to do is say, Jesus lives. All he needs to do is, Jesus died on the cross for your sins. All he needs to say, Jesus is resurrected. And he's the only God. And they look around them, they see the miracles happening in Jesus' name. Evil spirits are being cast out. I've told you I've been watching a few of the, the Chosen. I, I suggest it. I, I, hate to su- I hate to suggest this, but you can watch it free on BYU TV. Now, BYU TV is not like promoting Mormonism necessarily. Uh, probably there are some shows on there that are, but I would suggest it to watch The Chosen free. Okay? You can watch it free on BYU TV. The Chosen is really good. And the very first couple scenes is Mary Magdalene, who we don't know for sure, but it's possible she was a prostitute. And also that she was the one, one of the people that Jesus cast out demons. Watching that about Mary Magdalene is amazing. Watching what the evil spirit is causing her to do and what is just the, the difficult situation and then how Jesus shows compassion and loves her, casts the demon out of her. It's just wonderful. Like it is so beautiful, the way it's presented. Uh, that's what God was doing here in, in Ephesians. People were seeing that. They would run into people that had been affected because of the miracles that were happening. And what were they doing with their idols? They were destroying them. That's why this guy is so upset. Because of the transforming life of Jesus... It was making a huge difference. That's what was going on in this passage. Uh, And so, my challenge for you today as we come to the end of this message, we're done, basically, is there's a couple things that, that are true from this message. One is, Jesus lives, Satan is real, And there are other gods with a small g, but there's only one God with a big G, and that's that's Jesus. And he wins. And we can't let our livelihood, we cannot let economic situations get in the way of our service for Christ. Christ always needs to be first. Living a pure and holy life, living by God's word, should always come first as a priority in our, in our walk with Jesus. That's my challenge for all of you today. Live with Christ as the priority 
as these people in Ephesus did, as, the, as that city was transformed by the preaching of God's word, by the gospel. Let's pray. Dear Lord Jesus, thank you so much for your word. I am greatly challenged by the sacrifice of these men and women of, of Ephesus and of those in the Roman world that were making a difference, reaching out to people, people with difficult situations, people like someone like Mary Magdalene, the past of sin, uh, and they reached out to them. And it didn't matter what came in the way. There were no economic things that might get in the way. They were taking a stand for Jesus and the gospel. May we take this gospel and spread it, Lord. May we, may we know it. May we share it. May we like not be ashamed of it, Lord. It's, it's easy to take a step back sometimes, especially the way things are going in this world today. So many things that are taught in God's word are the opposite of those things are being taught by everyone, it seems like. And Lord, but we have the truth. May we never forget that and may we stand by it and live by it, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. You are dismissed.